February 25th uh, meeting of the city of McMinnville City Council. Uh, we are calling the meeting to order at 7.05 this evening. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if Adam would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. interested in giving a statement tonight uh, we have a, a time for public comment which is coming right up uh, anyone may speak on any topic other than a matter in litigation quasi judicial land use matter or a matter scheduled for public hearing at some future date comments will be limited to three minutes per person for a total of 30 minutes Please complete a request to speak card prior to the meeting. Speakers may not yield their time to others. Uh, at this time, I do have a card. Uh, it's Sid Freeman. Will you come up, Sid? Welcome. Thank you, Councilor Mankey. Uh, good evening, council members. Um, my name is Sid Friedman, and I have a few comments uh, this evening on behalf of Friends of Yamhill County and 1,000 Friends of Oregon on uh, McMinnville's urban growth management efforts. And I want to emphasize that these comments are made in the spirit of dialogue and cooperation. So at last Thursday's Planning Commission work session, there was a lot of good discussion around missing middle housing, design standards, and the related implementation of House Bill 2001, and it seems like there's some really good work being done by your staff and your planning commission on this issue, and I commend them on that. Um, at the end of the meeting, uh, the planning director announced that the city council would discuss next steps in the city's urban growth boundary efforts in executive session, including possible resubmission of the city's 2003 UGB amendment that was remanded by the Court of Appeals and possible pursuit of special legislation to exempt McMinnville from the urban growth boundary uh, amendment process that's laid out in statute and rule. And I was at the January work session where you discussed these and other possible next steps uh, in that process. Um, so we see that this evening's meeting includes executive session and whether or not tonight's executive session is the one that uh, the planning director referenced uh, to discuss urban growth boundary steps um, we have a, a just a few points we'd, uh, we'd like to quickly make um, first is at your january work session uh, the, the city council just about all of you to a person expressed a strong desire for a, for robust public input on what path uh, the city should take in, in the process. And um, going behind closed doors uh, in executive session seems antithetical to that desire that you expect, you express. And it's also something that could spark um, distrust and skepticism. Um, and also I point out that executive session is, is limited by law to a narrow set of circumstances. And these circumstances wouldn't seem to include old litigation that concluded in 2011. Um, so it's not readily apparent that um, urban growth boundary discussion falls uh, within the set of circumstances for which exe uh, uh, executive session is allowed. I just told, like to make a couple of other quick points. Uh, at the January work session, um, the planning director presented a lot of information, uh, and, and there was just some of it that was um, inaccurate or needs context, and I'd like to just hit on a couple of those. Um, in her presentation, the planning director said that the city has been plagued by constant challenges and appeals, and that McMinnville has been growth planning for 25 years and has been actively challenged for 20, 20 of those years. That's, a, in our view, that's a, a bit of hyperbole, a bit of a stretch. In fact, no appeal has been filed since 2007, and McMinnville essentially stopped its long-range planning efforts after the 20, 2011 Court of Appeals ruling before resuming them just over a year ago. Um, so then the other point is that during her presentation, um, 
a slide was shown of uh, what our organizations, uh, Friends of Yamal County, a thousand friends to, had agreed to be added to, to the urban growth boundary during a 2009 mediation effort. And um, she went on to orally describe these as these areas as exception lands. And said, she said that exception lands are lands that are, these are exception lands, exception lands are lands that are not exclusive farm use lands. They are lands that are developed. So her slide was partially correct and partially incorrect, but her oral description was, was clearly wrong. The lands we agreed to in mediation included about 350 buildable acres of mostly high value farmland, a farmland, most of it high value farmland, along with 27 more buildable acres. Sorry, your three minutes are up. I see my time is up. So once again, thank you. And we do offer these comments in the spirit of cooperation. Thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Our next uh, area will be uh, reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. So I think I'm gonna start down here with Zach. Thank you very much. Um, Landscape Review Committee met uh, the previous week and discussed a few um, exciting developments. Uh, the over down by Tommy's are looking at putting a speculative commercial property in um, out in the industrial lands um, and then reviewed the landscape for the storage uh, tiny home um, village tiny in Alpine. Over on nine, uh, Alpine. Yeah, on Alpine. Um, so it was good discussion. I saw some cool projects come across. Um, historic landmarks. Um, meets this tomorrow, uh, Thursday, um, and otherwise, our KOB Technical Advisory Committee is still waiting for that school board meeting. It's going to be great. Uh, and then our uh, Mac Pack is um, off and on the off and running. Uh, we've got a meeting coming up again for month two, in which like. It'll be a rousing panel um, where we can learn a lot about how we can be more equitable in our programming. And I think that about sums up my duties and responsibilities. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Wendy. Um, the Muroc meeting was canceled for this month, so I'll have a report probably the uh, next meeting. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Great job tonight on the level 10. Right. Uh, wow. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, the Mid Valley Council of Governments had its annual meeting. I was proud to present the award for regional cooperation to Sheridan, Willamina, and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde for a great wayfinding project that they have uh, been working on. Uh, the Council of Governments is also in the process of hiring a new executive director. Um, that process is also going well. So, lots of interesting things. Okay, it was a very nice event. Thank you, Sal. Thank you. Thank you for going. Adam? Uh, we had a WICOM meeting, but WAC quorum, so we did not uh, discuss anything. That'll just be postponed to our next regularly scheduled meeting. Airport Commission, we meet a week from today, 6.30 here in Civic Hall. If anybody would like to know what's going on at the airport firsthand, be there. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to that KOB meeting with uh, the school board. So if you're up for writing an email to a school board member, feel free. Thank you, Adam. Remy. Uh, so tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., um, the McMinnville Affordable Housing Task Force will meet. We'll be uh, meeting with Stuart Ramsing, a building official, and we'll also be getting an update on House Bill 4001, which is the state's emergency shelter uh, bill. Um, uh, on... Um, uh, kind of running off of that, there's a couple things that are not coming to council as um, uh, formal recommendations right now, but that are have been discussed amongst members of affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> so one um, more related to um, this house bill is there's some um, some misinformation that was circulated um, that the city of McMinnville. Uh, Turned down a million and a half dollars of um, uh, of, uh, of dollars that um, I think Jeff can speak to much more fluently than I can, or Sal, perhaps you could as well. Um, but uh, I just wanted to note that that was just a, a the language being misconstrued that the city of McMinnville did no such thing. Um, also, um, uh, 
not directly related to <clears throat> a recommendation from affordable housing, but um, the, uh, there is also a conversation happening that we would um, be interested in having a, an immediate conversation with council about um, a moratorium on any new um, vacation rentals. Um, and um, in the same vein, um, the Gospel Rescue Mission, uh, one of their approved shelters um, currently has a maximum occupancy of 13 beds, but they have room for 17 beds there. Um, and so there's been a request that the council um, uh, change the terms of that conditional use permit and allow them to provide those three extra beds. Um, and then lastly, the the other unofficial conversation that's happening but related to both of those is wanting to have a more thorough conversation with the council and the planning department um, about what an emergency ordinance would look like for the city of McMinnville. Um, and that conversation um, is one that uh, many of us feel need to happen rather immediately. Um, and it is a potential for us to have a work session to discuss uh, those things, but um, I think I can speak for at least two of us up here that we'd like to be able to have some conversation about it right away. Thank you, Remy. When, I, can I ask a follow-up question to Remy? When can we talk about the, thir the 13 to 17 bids in the short-term rental moratorium? When would you like us to talk about it? Because I'm ready to talk about it. I'm ready to talk about it. I think that's a procedural question for staff, if we can. I suspect it might have something to do with the fire department and the chief is. It doesn't have to do with the fire department. That research has been done. Yeah. Yep. So um, is, is all right, council president, if I provide please, some background on Please go right ahead. Um, so there's a conditional use permit application that was submitted by Gospel Rescue Mission as a land use process uh, in that they requested to build a shelter that accommodated 17 beds. Um, the land use decision put a condition on it that only allows it to have 13 beds. That's based on the size of the building that they provided at the time of the land use application and it's a building code issue. Um, you can only have so many beds in a certain size of a building. So uh, what we need to do is one, find out if the building code issue still pertains to the built environment. I don't know if it's the same size as what was proposed during the land use process. Um, if it was, then that's, that's kind of a mute point. We can't supersede the building code. However, if, if, it, if it wasn't built, to, if it's not a building code issue, right now there's a condition on the land use application that sort of locks it very succinctly into those 13 beds, so it would be an amendment of that conditional use permit application. If it is relative to just the building code issue and we can revise that if building codes have changed or the building's bigger than was originally proposed, there might be a way, I'm gonna work with legal counsel, there might be a way to look at the condition of approval on the land use application and see if we can make that tie to have that revised as well without going through a land use process again. We haven't done that research in that regard. Okay, so I'm assuming we'll, we'll leave that with you and you'll be able to let us know what's gonna happen. Thank you, Heather, very much. And then what about the short-term rental moratorium? It was a two-parter, all right, it was a two-parter. How, how, what's the path to bringing that to a discussion here where we could discuss and resolve on that? I, it's not an agenda item tonight and I don't, think we're really prepared to discuss it in depth. Correct, Heather? Uh, it's the first I've heard of it, so. Okay, <laughs> so I, I think this one will have to be put off until another meeting or tabled for the time being. But I, I do agree that it certainly is a topic for discussion, but I would like to have a majority of the council be able to weigh in on it <clears throat> uh, with a good presentation, so. I just, I, if I could be so bold, I would suggest that you send us an email and ask it to be added to the master issues list and we'll put it on an agenda for a future level 10 meeting. It is on there. It's already on there, yeah. Right. We'll vote well, for it. And you're gonna That's get, you you're gonna get it. to it when the time is right. All right, so those of us that are interested, be sure to rank that number one next time. Voting. Okay, uh, from my point of view, uh, there is a urbanization pack meeting on Thursday. I believe it's from four to six, am I correct? Or is it 3.30 to 5.30 or something like that? I'm really bad. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> okay, we both know. At any rate, I, I'm sure if you check with the uh, city calendar, you can see what's happening on that day. 4.30 Sakai was right the first time, good. Okay, uh, very interesting discussion. Please attend if you can. Uh, from my point of view, I do also represent on the Visit McMinnville board. The city councilors have a piece of current advertising from uh, the Visit McMinnville. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, regarding wine, Oregon has the most growth, growth over the entire country, uh, over, over all areas that are producing wine at this particular last year. And this is possibly due to oversupply, perception of smoke taint, bad weather, crop failure. California, Europe, and Australia, and New Zealand have all had major uh, ecological issues. And for those of you that are into biking, uh, we are going to be hosting the Yam Hill Fondo, or that is to say Yam Hill will be, uh, which is a race on uh, bikes over gravel. It sounds like a lot of fun, and so uh, mark your calendars. I'll have more information on that one of these days. At this point in time, our city attorney, Walt Gell, will present to us on campaign finance disclosure ordinance. Thank you, Councilman Menke. I, th this is a staff report coming back to the council from a, um, an initial brief discussion the council had regarding campaign finance. And, uh, and uh, so the purpose of this uh, presentation is to provide the council with uh, basic information about the issue of campaign finance in Oregon, the current initiatives that are undertaking the current litigation that is uh, uh, underway, uh, the current uh, uh, statewide initiative that, is, excuse me, statewide uh, joint resolution that's going to the ballot in November, um, and, this, and of course, uh, two bills that were passed this past June in 2019 that bear on the issue of campaign finance disclosure. Um, but let me just start by um, saying that 25 years ago, the people of Oregon, through the initiative process, brought Measure 9 to the ballot and passed it. And that was an initial campaign finance measure which limited the amount of permissible campaign expenditures by campaigns. It limited third-party expenditures that were not approved by candidates. It limited candidates' use of out-of-district uh, contributions. In other words, it had a geographic uh, element to it. Uh, it. It interestingly required candidates for election to either accept or not accept uh, voluntary limits on campaign expenditures and to have their election published. Um, and those were the, the, the basic issues that were, were on uh, Measure 9. It, it ended up uh, being appealed uh, after it passed. Uh, and it was, uh, it went to the Oregon Supreme Court in 1997, a fairly well-known case called Fred Venata versus Phil Kiesling. Um, and the Oregon Supreme Court uh, interpreted the Oregon Constitution for provisions relating to the regulation and conduct of elections and prohibitions against all undue influence therein from power, bribery, tumult, or other improper conduct. These are phrases from the Constitution. The court ruled in, in Venata basically that political contributions constitute expression, a form of expression that are entitled to constitutional protection. Um, the court ruled that there is a difference between the authority of the legislature to regulate elections and the authority to regulate campaigns. I wish the court had been more specific about the differences, but it distinguished between the two. Um, it said that limits on campaign expenditures are unconstitutional limits on free expression. It said that geographical limitations on donors are impermissible. Uh, and the court made a couple of statements that I noted when I was reading the case. It said, we conclude that Article 2, Section 8 does not empower the legislature to regulate every kind of alleged undue influence arising out of political contributions and expenditures during political campaigns. We conclude that the contribution limitations imposed by Measure 9 are targeted at protected speech. Finally, the court upheld 
the publication in the voters' pamphlet of a candidate's decision to either accept or reject voluntary limit on campaign expenditures as not being an improperly coercive um, form of regulation. Many years went by, and in 1916, Multnomah County um, uh, voted. Uh, in, in November of 2016, uh, Multnomah County voted on a charter amendment, and that established that candidate contributions uh, would be limited to $500, established independent expenditure limits for individuals of $5,000 and $10,000 for political co uh, committees. It imposed a registration requirement for political committees expending over $750, and it imposed disclosure requirements on campaign communications of the five largest donors over $500. So that on uh, on, on publications, they had to disclose who were the five largest donors for that paid for this campaign communication that contributed more than $500. Um, the, the county uh, put this measure, it, it was voted on, it, it uh, passed. Uh, the county uh, put it before the circuit court of Multnomah County in a validation proceeding, which struck down the contribution limits struck down the expenditure limits, struck down the disclosure requirements, upheld the employee uh, withholding contribution provisions, and upheld the registration of political committee requirements. Multnomah County filed an appeal to the circuit court ruling, which was certified through the efforts of a gentleman in the back of the room, among others, to directly to the Supreme Court in order to fast track that appeal. That appeal is, uh, currently um, awaiting a decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, it was argued in uh, December, excuse me, I believe November of 2019. Two years later, the citizens of Portland voted on a charter amendment in 2018, which had similar provisions relating to contribution limits of $500 in candidate elections. These were not measure elections. It established a payroll deduction contribution right by employees. It'll, it required registration with the Secretary of State of campaign committees that were expending over $750. It limited in independent individual campaign expenditures to $5,000. It limited uh, independent aggregate political committee expenditures to $10,000 subject to a $500 per donor limit. And it required timely and prominent disclosure of the original source of large contributions and the top five dominant contributors for communications to voters related to candidate elections. So on circulars that went out or letters that went out, you had to disclose who were the top five donors uh, for that, uh, that were paying for that. Um, this, uh, this, uh, Charter amendment was reduced to an ordinance and that ordinance was appealed. And the same circuit court judge who had ruled on the Multnomah County validation proceeding was the judge in the Portland uh, uh, proceeding. Uh, in that case, he struck down the contribution limits. Uh, judge Block struck down the expenditure limits. He upheld the disclosure requirements ruling that the problems he found in the Multnomah County ordinance had been uh, resolved uh, by the Portland uh, ordinance. He upheld the employee withholding contribution provisions and he upheld the registration requirements. That decision at the circuit court level was appealed uh, in a validation proceeding and uh, is currently at the Court of Appeals. That proceeding was stayed in December uh, pending the outcome of the Multnomah County appeal that's pending before the Supreme Court. So. The decision of the Court of Appeals in the city of McMinnville uh, validation proceeding is right now on hold, uh, wait, awaiting the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision uh, in Multnomah County's case. Now, that Multnomah County case argument was held in November, as I said, of, of 2019, and the, the Supreme Court's publication that they put out uh, it's, it's called a statement of issues. 
um, it, it, that uh, it's otherwise known as an entry form, uh, which the Supreme Court publishes to assist people who are trying to describe what is this case about that's coming before the court, described three issues that the court was going to be hearing argument about. It said to the restrictions in the section 1160 and ordinance 1243 on contributions and expenditures violate the right of free expression under Article 1, Section 8 of the Oregon Constitution or the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So that's the first issue. The second issue is, do the disclosure requirements in Section 11.16 of Ordinance 1243 constitute impermissible compelled speech under either Constitution? Which is an interesting concept, the notion of compelled speech, but the notion that your name would be disclosed as being a donor, uh, uh, whether or not you give permission for that disclosure, uh, I think is what the court was, was getting at. Uh, um, you may have more comment on that later. Um, and third, the, the payroll deduction provision of the Multnomah County Ordinance, the question was whether that was preempted by a state statute uh, that was in existence and whether that uh, made that, that county ordinance invalid. Subsequent, prior to the court's argument in November on the Multnomah County Ordinance, the legislature uh, weighed in and adopted uh, joint resolution number 18, which is scheduled for a November 2020 vote. Uh, that um, measure, which you know, all of us will get a chance to vote on in November, in November would add a section two to uh, section uh, eight uh, uh, of, I believe it's article two, um, of the Constitution, but it does, it, what it does is it authorizes cities, counties, uh, districts, um, empower that it would empower them to limit contributions made in connection with political campaigns or to influence the outcome of elections in a manner that does not um, prevent candidates and political com committees from gathering the resources necessary for effective advocacy. So that's an if but it would certainly authorize some form of campaign limitations, uh, some level of campaign uh, uh, contribution limitations. Second, it would require the disclosure of contributions or expenditures made in connection with political campaigns or to influence the outcome of uh, any election. Third, it would require that any advertisement made in connection with a political campaign or to influence the outcome ordinances that would mandate it. And fourth, it would allow limit expenditures made in connection with political campaigns or to influence the outcomes of elections to the extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States. So this would amend the Oregon Constitution to essentially bring it in line with the federal, uh, con with the, uh, the United States Constitution's campaign finance limitations uh, as it relates to uh, expenditure limitations. Um, I think the purpose, as it was explained in legislative testimony, was to avoid the preclusion by the Oregon Constitution of most campaign finance regulations on the part of uh, governments within the state of Oregon. And the, the language relating to contributions in a manner that does not prevent candidates and political committees from gathering the resources necessary was essentially put into that resolution, as I understand it, to implement a case by the name of Lair versus Mott, which created a standard that was approved by the Ninth Circuit and not reviewed by the Supreme Court. In other words, the court de denied cert on that issue. So that standard is part of this, uh, uh, as I understand it, designed to be incorporated into Joint Resolution 18. Finally, two more, two more points uh, that I want to uh, cover. In 2019, the Oregon legislature adopted two disclosure statutes. One was called House Bill 2716, and it regulated communications made in support of candidates by requiring disclosure on campaign literature as to the five largest donors paying for the communication where the aggregate donations exceed 10,000. So it set a standard of this, where you had more than 10,000 of donations, the five largest donors would have to be 
uh, would have to be disclosed on campaign communications. Uh, it, it creates certain exemptions for charitable organizations and others. Um, finally, uh, House Bill 2983, also passed in June, it regulates communications made in support of both candidates and measures by, by requiring disclosure of campaign donations, um, but it establishes a $25,000 threshold for regulation of city measures for cities smaller than 60,000. So that's nearly all cities in Oregon. It would include McMinnville. So before you could regulate a, a, an organization or a c political committee, as I read this bill, they would have to be expending uh, more than $25,000. Below that, uh, the limit, you could not limit their expenditures. Finally, it would disclose or that bill, once the threshold was met, would require disclosure of donors, donors contributing to candidates or measures uh, where aggregate don donations exceed 10,000 and the donation, the disclosure to be made within seven days after making a campaign communication. So you have to promptly disclose when you send out campaign literature, who paid for it, uh, uh, where the aggregate donations exceed 10,000. Uh, it would also permit anonymous donations over $1,000 to be used for campaign communications. So that those are the two bills. They both relate to disclosure. One relates to candidate measures, to candidate races only. The other one relates to both candidate measures and, um, and other measures that don't relate to persons seeking political office. And so what I, what I provided with your materials was a copy of the Portland uh, ordinance that uh, was uh, that was found to be largely acceptable in the disclosure area uh, uh, by Judge uh, Block. Uh, and uh, so, so I wanted to give you those specific provisions that were upheld. They're marked in green. The ones that were, uh, which were ruled uh, unconstitutional are marked in red. Also, I thought it would be useful to give you a, a, a status of the campaign finance charter amendment that has been issued in December by the Portland City Auditor, Mary Hall C uh, Caballero, which I thought was a very succinct discussion of the status of the Portland uh, process and the amendment and where it currently sits and what it's waiting for in order to be finally, uh, to have a, f a final validation. Um, with that, I would, uh, I, I, I would take any questions from the council if you have any other, Otherwise, I, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dan Meek, who is in the uh, in the audience and who has been an, a advocate for uh, campaign finance reform for the last 20, 25 years, uh, and is well and is well aware and has participated, I believe, in the litigation that's ongoing, to perhaps come forward and give the. Uh, the the uh, council some additional information and perhaps be able to respond to some questions. Dan. Just, oh, got it. Can we turn that off for now? Thank you, Walt. Can, I, can we turn it off for a while? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good evening, members of the uh, City of McMinnville City Council. I'm Dan Meek. I'm a volunteer attorney um, this evening for the an organization called Honest Elections Oregon which was the, the primary organization that brought forward the uh, ballot measures that you heard about from Multnomah County in 2016 and for the city of Portland in 2018. Um, your attorney, Walt Gowell, has presented a entirely accurate summary of what's going on, although I think um, maybe I could add a couple of details here and there. Uh, one detail is that the important part about those ballot measures is that each of them passed with over 87% yes vote so um, they're pretty popular measures. 
Another important overview is that um, the various cases that your attorney discussed, striking down various things, um, none of them except, well, you'll, I'll explain it in a second. None of them uh, until 2018 addressed, limit, addressed disclosures or what we call disclaimers or taglines on political advertising. All of them involved limits on contributions, not disclosure of contributions. And there's a big difference there. Uh, also, there are a couple of statutes that Walt didn't mention. Oregon actually has had limits on campaign contributions and required some required disclosures. Um, since the 1864 Corrupt Practices Act, uh, which banned candidates from bribing voters with you know, money or drink or debauchery, that's how money was used mainly in political campaigns back then. And then in 1908, the voters of Oregon, using the, the newly crafted initiative power, uh, enacted a very sweeping statute that placed limits on campaign contributions, created the voters pamphlet, required that uh, political ads uh, identify their sponsors. So that was all done in a very comprehensive way in 1908. And those, all of those requirements were in place um, fully in place and enforced, not challenged as unconstitutional, they had very low limits on contributions, uh, until 1973. And in 1973, the Oregon legislature repealed them, repealed the limits on contributions, replaced them with only limits on overall, which were then struck down overwhelmingly, 73% yes vote. And those limits were in place for one election cycle, the 1996 cycle, and then this is, your attorney mentioned they were the, the, the limits on contributions were struck down. Since then, the amount of money spent on political campaigns in Oregon as a, generally has increased by a factor of 10. Legislative races, it's 10 times more now than it was in 1996. And for the governor's race, it's more than 20 times more than it was in, 19, in 1996. So, um, your attorney reviewed the various um, uh, cases. I would just uh, make a couple of additions to that if I could. The, um, as he reports, the, the court in 1997 in the Van Natta versus Kiesling decision uh, ruled that political contributions constitute expression entitled to protection. That particular conclusion was then countermanded by the court in 2009 in an, another case brought by Fred Van Natta versus the Oregon Government Ethics Commission. And it was about the, the limits on, on gifts that lobbyists could give to legislators and other public officials and candidates. So the 2007 Oregon legislature limited those gifts to $50 per occasion. So the lobbyists hired, hired a lawyer to go challenge that. And no, gifts are, gifts are just like campaign contributions. They are their, their expression, their speech, they express something. And the Oregon Supreme Court in 2009 said, no, nope, transfers of property are not expression. And we expressly repudiate what we said in 1997. Um, the court in, in the limits, in the gift limits case also said that um, it's okay, limits on receiving transfers of property from someone are acceptable, while limits on giving might not be acceptable. Well, of course, if a candidate cannot receive a contribution, then the, the potential donor can't give it. In any, in any event, the court said that uh, limits on, on receiving contributions are acceptable. And that's one reason why the subsequent measures of all um, limited receipt of contributions as their, as their primary method of limitation. As for the Multnomah County and uh, Portland ordinances and, and charter amendments, um, the limitations on contributions also has a special feature, the small donor committee feature, that anyone can form a small donor committee which can receive contributions only from individuals and only in amounts of $100 or less, and then can, can um, contribute the accumulated funds to any or, any or all candidates or, or make independent expenditures with them. Um, uh, your attorney is correct about what the court, about what the Multnomah County Circuit Court did in 2018 with the Multnomah County measure, um, and he's correct. We had oral argument with the Supreme Court last November on it, and we would expect a decision. Could be, could be tomorrow. It could be a year from now. Um, I would, 
I hope it would be sometime this spring uh, before the summer, but um, they can make the decision whenever they want. The important part about that judge, about Judge uh, Eric Block's uh, decision in Multnomah County Circuit Court on the Portland measure in 2019 is that he upheld the disclosure and the, and the disclaimer requirements because uh, his, he struck down the, the Multnomah County ones uh, primarily because he thought they were too vague, and they were. Um, they were only one sentence. Um, <laughs> and they were pretty vague. <laughs> the re reason for that is that that measure was, um, was crafted by a subcommittee of the Multnomah County Charter Review Committee, and they wanted to keep it simple. So they kept the whole measure to three pages. So, yep, it was vague. Um, when Honest Elections Oregon had the opportunity to, to draft its own measure as an initiative for Portland, then it added about a, a page and a half of, of detail to that particular requirement. And the judge said, yep, that, that looks good. Um, and so he upheld that. And as I think I noted before, no Oregon court except Judge Block except in the Multnomah County case, ever has ever struck down a disclosure or a disclaimer requirement. By disclaimer, I mean um, something that you have to put in the advertisement itself or in your, in your brochure or, or um, whatever you're using to communicate with voters, except small items are exempted, you know, pens, pencils, buttons, et cetera. You don't have to, to list your donors on those. The um, Oregon courts have never struck down such requirements. The uh, Oregon Attorney General in 1999 issued an opinion saying that the requirement that Oregon voters adopted in 1908 to require that political ads at least identify their sponsors, um, the Attorney General said that was, uh, would violate Oregon, Oregon's Article 1, Section 8. Um, and so the legislature then took the opportunity to immediately repeal the, dis the disclaimer requirements in Oregon law that had been in place for 60, 67, no, not 67, 80, about 90 years, um, even though no court had ever ruled them unconstitutional. And now, as your attorney indicates, the um, Oregon legislature in this past session um, repudiated that attorney general opinion because they adopted, uh, two, uh, adopted one law that requires uh, disclaimers, or we also call them taglines, on political ads in Oregon, and that's uh, House Bill 2716. I would note, however, that that law, new law, does not apply at all to ads that are placed by candidates or candidate committees. It only applies to independent expenditures. So in Oregon, about 95% of all ads are placed by candidates or candidate committees, so those will remain they can remain, uh, those ads can remain totally anonymous. They, don't, they only have to be identified by the name of the committee, which is almost always the name of the candidate. So uh, that's one way that, um, that we think that House Bill 2716 is, is tremendously deficient. They, it should require that the candidates also disclose their, their large contributors in, any, um, in their campaign ads. House Bill 2983 actually only applies to what I would call internal transactions of a nonprofit corporation. Under previously existing law, any nonprofit corporation could assemble money from any source from any sources that it wanted to. And then if it put on an independent expenditure ad, it wouldn't have to identify itself at all. Under House Bill 2716, it would have to identify, it would have to at least identify itself. But because 2716 has no drill down, what we call drill down provision to the true original sources of the money, it doesn't have to disclose anything else. So what 2983 does is it basically requires that nonprofit corporations identify where their money is coming from. So it's kind of a one step drill down but it doesn't require anything beyond that. So it's really quite easily to avoid, easy to avoid. All you need to do to avoid it is create another nonprofit corporation and insert that one into the chain of money. So the money goes from whatever sources to nonprofit corporation A and then nonprofit corporation B 
And then in the advertisement, all he also identifies nonprofit corporation B and not any of the contributors to nonprofit corporation A. So it was another, um, another I think, highly defective measure. Um, and I think it will be ineffective. So on the subject of, let's see, this is, the arrow keys are not working on this. Maybe these keys, there we go, I got it. Sorry about that. Boop, boop, boop. On the subject of disclosure, just a couple of, uh, of slides. Um, Oregon is actually um, quite deficient when it comes to disclosure and, and disclaimer requirements in, in political ads. Uh, so I mentioned the Oregon legislature repealed the law requiring that political ads identify their source. At least that's come back now in, in HB 2716 from last year. Uh, the Corporate Reform Coalition said that only six states are worse than Oregon in disclosing independent expenditures, gave Oregon an F, gave Washington an A. Oregon now, I think, will earn a better grade because of the two bills that we mentioned, but I don't think it will receive a, a good grade. Maybe it would be uh, better than an F, but still uh, considerably uh, worse than an A. Um, the, the kind of tagline requirements that are adopted in, oh, one thing I definitely should point out. After the um, Multnomah County Circuit Court upheld the tagline requirements in the Portland Charter Amendment, Multnomah County then adopted a new ordinance for taglines that used exactly the language from the Portland Charter Amendment. So now we have exactly the same language for taglines in place in both Multnomah County and Portland, and that language has been upheld by Multnomah County Circuit Court, and no one has appealed that. The appeal from the Multnomah County Circuit Court decision was on the limits, was folks who believe that the limits should be um, upheld, and that's both um, a number of citizens that I represent as well as the city of Portland itself and, and the city attorney. So the kind of tagline requirements that were adopted in, in Portland and Multnomah County are also in place um, in various ways in these 11 states. And it seems that a, a few states adopt them in every succeeding year. The main difference, difference among the states is to what extent they require drill down to the true original sources. Washington last year actually copied our Portland ordinance, Portland Charter Amendment. The Portland Charter Amendment says if any of the top five contributors is a political committee, then the ad also must disclose the top three contributors to the political committee. You can't just use the you know, euphonious name of a political committee, the good things for Portland committee. You have to then identify the top three contributors there. It's a, it's a level of drill down. Washington then copied that in, in 2019 and put that into their statewide measure. Other states, they vary the, to the degree that they do require drill down. Uh, some have statutes that require drill down right to the bottom. There's no limit on the number of layers that you can go, um, and others don't. The, the primary example, I think, of the effect of taglines on political ads is what happened in the city of Richmond, California in 2014. The, um, the, uh, within the city limits of Richmond is a very large Chevron refinery that was having a, a series of accidents and releasing uh, clouds of toxic gases. And the city council of Richmond, um, major fire there, sent thousands of people to the hospitals. The city of Richmond, the city council then decided, well, we're going to consider an ordinance to require Chevron to at least notify us when the toxic gas cloud has been released so we can you know, evacuate people. Well, Chevron took umbrage and decided instead of, instead of doing that, it would take over the city. And so it uh, recruited candidates for the mayorship and all city council positions that were up, spent over $3 million promoting its four candidates. This is a city of about 100,000 people. It outspent the other candidates by a factor of 50 to one. But California law required that the ads identify their major funder. So all of their ads, billboards, brochures, et cetera, did have to say, did have to include major funder Chevron Inc. And all of their candidates uh, lost overwhelmingly. 
The other example, more recently, I think, is the city of Seattle city council race just last November. You may have read that Amazon and other corporations got together and uh, spent several million dollars in independent expenditures in those races um, because the city council was considering various kinds of taxes on, on Amazon and, and large national level corporations. Uh, but it turns out that despite being outspent um, massively, um, the in, there were seven races where there were large uh, contributions by, the, by Amazon and other corporations in, in the Seattle uh, City Council races. The, the corporate candidates lost in six out of the seven races. In Washington, all of their ads had to identify their top funders, um, plus the top three funders to any political committee. So I heard a couple of those ads. Some of them were on TV in Portland because they just were. Um, and um, some of the ads, 30 second ads, 25 of the 30 seconds consisted of disclosing who was paying for it. And um, I think that, had, that could well have had an effect on who, on who won those elections. So um, that's about it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'd just like to make one comment to, to add to Dan's comments. Uh, with regard to Judge Block's ruling in the Portland matter, I think his uh, his argument and or his decision, I should say, regarding the upholding of the disclosure requirements that Portland adopted was very persuasive. I found it very well written, and uh, um, it, held, it to me it held together very well. So just as a question, if McMinnville were interested in uh, also doing something similar to what Portland has done, um, are we waiting for anything? We're still waiting for a particular ruling or anything, or could we enact this? Um, let me give the first response oh, to that. Um, the. Uh, Joint Resolution 18 has a specific final provision that says that subsection two of this section applies to laws and ordinances enacted by the legislature or assembly or the governing body of a city, which are enacted or approved by the people through the initiative process on or after January 1, 2016. So the effect of that is to um, retroactively approve constitutional measures which the, which the ballot measure up, uh, upholds if passed. So it does not stop communities from adopting measures prior to the election if they choose or wish to do so. It doesn't mandate it or require it. Uh, the, the councils may choose to want to wait until after the election and see what the voters have to say. But, uh, but it does retroactively validate them to the extent they're, in, they're consistent with the provisions in the constitutional amendment. I, I would agree with that. Also, um, there is no current pending challenge to any of the um, disclaimer requirements. The, in the Multnomah County case at the Supreme Court, the, uh, the folks who were you know, opposing the, the measure, um, the Realtors Association, um, OBI, Oregon Business and Industries, and uh, the Portland Business Association, their attorney said that he he totally agreed that the disclaimer provisions in the Multnomah County Charter and Ordinance, that any dispute about them was moot because um, a week earlier, Multnomah County had adopted the Portland version of the disclaimer requirement. So I don't expect that the Oregon Supreme Court's forthcoming decision on the Multnomah County measure will address the disclaimer requirement. Probably won't. In the Portland case, we have the Portland case at the Oregon Court of Appeals where the only parties there are the city of Portland and my clients, uh, nine citizens. And um, neither the city of Portland nor my clients will argue that the disclaimer requirements are unconstitutional. Nobody else is there. And um, and 
Judge Block ruled that those disclaimer requirements were constitutional. So I don't think that case is going to address um, any further than what Judge Block did, the, the constitutionality of the disclaimer requirements. And as Mr. Gowell said, the Oregon voters in November may well retroactively adopt, you know, SCR 18, which would which would validate any such requirements that this commission would adopt, um, no matter when it adopts it at this point, since we're now safely after January 1st, 2016. That obviously was a provision um, uh, that my clients insisted be put into SGR 18 in order to validate the Portland and Multnomah County measures so that we didn't have to defend, uh, depend completely upon what the Oregon Supreme Court might say. So. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, thanks for coming and giving that comprehensive testimony. I appreciate your coming down. Uh, so I just want to confirm. So right now we've got the Portland City Charter, the Multnomah County Charter, and the state laws relating to campaign finance disclaimers, and all of those are going to be enforced for 2020. Uh, and to your knowledge, no challenges on the horizon for those on this uh, in this election cycle. Correct. All of both the city of Portland and Multnomah County have said they're they're enforcing the disclaimer requirements. Um, I would point out that there will probably be complaints filed in the near future about the about candidates who are not complying with the, the Portland candidates who are not complying with the disclaimer requirements. So um, I would like to suggest to the council that we um, you know, even though the there is going to be a constitutional amendment that voters are going to vote on that would allow us, in addition to adopting disclosure and disclaimer requirements, to also adopt contribution limits, I think because the contribution limits are still subject to that voter approval, we should probably leave those aside. But I think we should consider passing uh, disclosure and disclaimer requirements similar or the same ones that they've adopted in Portland. And uh, earlier in this meeting, I sent uh, uh, some materials that I think I'd previously sent to council, but that included a description of the Portland campaign finance disclosure requirements, and then also a link to the city auditor's um, description of, of the uh, disclaimers as they are written there. But I, I think we ought to adopt that uh, campaign disclaimer pretty much in whole as a city uh, for 2020. So are you saying everybody got this tonight? Or before now? Well, I'd, I'd How long out, have people had this? Sent out materials. Um, to the city manager, I think they were forwarded previously, probably a month or two ago, and then I've resent those materials this evening. Um, even if we can't vote on it tonight because it wasn't an order of business, I, I I would like to, you know, maybe take the temperature of the council and. So, I guess starting with Adam, any thoughts on this? I definitely wouldn't be in favor of any contribution limits, but I'd be open for the discussion of disclosure. I don't know if tonight's tonight to vote on it, but definitely ahead of this election cycle. Remy? Um, I've reviewed the timely disclosure of large contributions and expenditures uh, implemented by the city of Portland, and I would be in favor of um, implementing something similar here or the same. Zach? Yeah, same. Does that, I just have confusion, that comes from this body or we refer that to the voters of this city? Either way. Either way. Either way. Yeah. You, you can adopt your own ordinance. Or we could refer. Or you can refer a proposed ordinance to the voters. You know, that would not probably get the ballot until, yeah, probably November. Right. Conceivably, you could have it in a special election before that. 
I like the idea of the voters setting the rules for the elected officials that the voters make. And I know that's probably a more, a different process. So uh, just for your information, Zach, a special election, say, it would probably cost us around $69,000. Uh, if we can tack it into an already existing general election, not well, making a special election just for that ordinance. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the only comment I would make is if you're going to wait till November to have the voters vote on it, you might want to wait till just after November and adopt more comprehensive mm. because you may have the ability to uh, adopt contribution and expenditure limits if measure, if joint resolution 18 passes. And so, uh, Councillor, where are you coming from with that? What, what's well, I don't know. Um, seems like a slippery slope having the current office holders set the rules for gaining the future position in the future office holders. But that's the policy we were, if that's the position we were put to set the policy on how we want to enact, how we want to elect our officers. I don't know how to rectify the difference in those in my mind. I guess just my perspective, uh, I, I would think that if we were to do something more um, significant like campaign contribution limits that would significantly uh, really change how campaigns are run I would agree with you but in this case we're really providing more information for voters so they can make an informed choice when they get printed materials a lot of times people don't realize what the source of that material is but by getting the information as far as who's paying for it mm -hmm. give them more context for evaluating the accuracy of the statements and that, that's my reason for supporting it. I, I just think that voters deserve to have all of the information in front of them when they're making a decision. Uh, this doesn't restrict anybody from making contributions. It doesn't restrict groups from engaging in the process, restrict candidates from accepting contributions in any amount. It just says that when they do that, they need to report the true sources of who's financing their effort. Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, I appreciate the clarity on that and the of your position and with the information. I also totally agree with where this is coming from and where it goes. If it puts a thumb on the scale for openness and you know information and, and the truth behind all that, I'm totally in favor. I just, I just wanna make sure we're the right people to make that rule. And I, yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm in line and in favor. I'm, I'm also in favor of the, um, the disclosure portion of it and waiting on the campaign finance until it's clear what the, what's going to happen at the legislative level. So the next question would be, uh, are we interested in asking uh, the city manager to come back with a resolution for us? Or do we want to wait it out and see what happens after the election. I think we can um, look for a, a resolution on just the portion about giving information to disclosure. Okay, how does everyone feel about that? Could I just get a quick yay or nay? Yay. Uh, yay. All right, then, Jeff, we would like to have you bring forward a resolution. Or that, that'll be in the form of an ordinance. Yeah, I think ordinance, it would need then. to be in the form of an ordinance. Um, the city attorney and I can work on that and report sure. back in terms of a time frame. Happy to do that. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you so much for coming and speaking with us, and thank you, Walt, for all your work. Appreciate it. Okay, we are to the consent agenda. There are three items on it. Uh, does anyone desire to pull off any particular item for separate consideration tonight? Or, or I see no one saying they want to, so could I have a motion then to pass the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Remy and moved and I think Adam seconded, so we got them. Okay. Um, So, all in favor of the motion, please uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Uh, we have a unanimous vote on for aye, yes. Did you get the two people and everything? Okay, great. <clears throat> so, 
we were moving on. We're looking at resolution number 2020-09, a resolution authorizing the city manager, <coughs> excuse me, to enter into a contract to purchase real property from Yamhill County for affordable housing. Heather, would you please present this issue? Yeah, so Council and President, Councilors, this is a recommendation coming to you from the Affordable Housing Task Force. It's a project that they've been working on uh, for a little over a year now, and it was it's a partnership with the Amhill County, um, or maybe two years ago at this point in time. Yeah, it's about um, two years. The chair of the task force and I went and met with uh, Commissioner Sterrett a couple of years ago to talk about opportunities associated with foreclosed residential properties in McMinnville in terms of trying to leverage those for affordable housing projects. Um, after some review, the county agreed to um, entertain visiting, entertain entering agreement with the city to sell those properties to the city for the amount of the taxes owed on the property. The city would then uh, put out an RFP for um, developers to sell the property to them, have them invest in it, rehab it, and then put it into service for a certain amount of years to be used as affordable housing with one of our housing providers for some of our disadvantaged populations. So t before you tonight is the um, authorization for the city manager to enter into a real estate transaction for the purchase of a property for $14,945.31. Um, we'll go through about 30 days of due diligence on the property, including earnest money of $500, uh, working through it. it is, the purchase is as is. Um, and then after the purchase, we would put together a request for proposals for the development community to consider rehabbing the property um, and purchasing it and then putting it into service for a certain amount of years. It will be a competitive RFP process, so we'll ask how much uh, they would pay for it, how much they'd invest in it, and how much they'd be willing to give it for free to one of our housing providers to be used for affordable housing for a certain number of years uh, for some of our disadvantaged populations. So this is the first step in terms of the city acquiring the property. The funds are meant to come out of your affordable housing um, trust fund that you set up, um, and that's authorized in the fiscal year budget uh, in this fiscal year. So any questions or comments, please? Adam? As we move uh, down this road and through this process, what other expenses would the city be putting out or as the applicant in that RFP going to be incurring all the costs? Uh, the intention is that the applicant and the RFP will be incurring all the costs and and it essentially probably based on a competitive process and there is there are developers in the community who are interested in in, in this project that actually came from a conversation with the development community. Um, since it would be a competitive process, the, the expectation is that someone would come in with a bid for the property that might be below market value, put some money into the property to rehab it, dedicate it for a certain amount of years, and that's a competitive part of the review process too, um, for, for in-service for affordable housing, and eventually it becomes housing stock, market rate housing, again, in our community. So right now, it's not housing anybody. And as far as uh, management of when it is in uh, affordable housing, uh, who's the provider for that? Have we identified that or is that through? A when it is affordable housing? Yeah. Yeah, so the intention is that um, it, it would be managed by that partnership with the provider. Oh, so the city would not be the manager. So the developer that we pick for the RFP would pick the management team for that? Uh, no, the city would pick the management. So the city would work with a provider that we would hook up with this property for those in-service years. Um, and then the developer would have a contract with that provider for how long it's donated to them to use. And then the provider would manage the occupancy of it. So the city is really the system for getting this property into this RFP process. Originally, we had talked about working with the county and having them do this RFP process, but they can't legally do it. There is a statute that prevents them from doing that. They can sell it to another public agency, i.e. the city, and the city can then engage in that process. This has been reviewed by both Yamhill County Legal Council and City Legal Council to sort of work through um, what it would look like. It would be seen as a pilot project for the state probably because it's it's an interesting way to look at foreclosed properties and it, that the county owns in cities and trying to leverage them for affordable housing without incurring costs at the city level. 
Yeah. Um, only other question would be, do we have a identified provider or two that has sustainable funding and capacity to manage said we have, housing? We've had discussions with a couple of different providers. Okay. Thank you. Remy, any questions? No questions. Okay, down here, Zach. Any questions? Question. Wendy. Great. Yeah, so? looks like a good project. It's an excellent project. <laughs> May I have a motion then, please? So moved. Wendy. Second. And a second from Remy. So Wendy moves uh, for the motion and Remy for the second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, so indicate by saying nay. I believe we have the unanimous vote. It's <laughs> <laughs> about a long time coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. The black hole of money. Oh, no, it's six no, it's yeah. Okay. Um, consideration of resolution 2020-13, a resolution, a resolution appointing Peter Hofstetter, Allison Seeler, Wendy Phoenix as representatives to the McMinnville Budget Committee. Uh, Jennifer Quello, would you please, uh, our CFO, will you please tell us all about this? Um, sure, so there were, um, there are three open positions on the budget committee currently, and so we're looking for appointments for three-year terms. There were five people who um, you applied, and the, um, the selection committee ended up with um, moving three names forward. So it would include a reappointment of Peter Hofstetter, um, who's been on the budget committee before. Um, he's not here with us today. Um, and then two new members, um, Allison Seeler and Wendy Phoenix, also here in the room, uh, would be new members to the budget committee. So we're just really thrilled to see new folks stepping up and taking interest in the budget process. And staff recommends that you all appoint these um, three members of the community to the budget committee. I believe you'll see their applications in the, the report. <coughs> uh, does anyone have any questions or concerns? Uh, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Zach and Adam. Second. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Uh, I believe the ayes have it at six. Or, yeah, it's six. Okay. Doing good. So moving on. Thank you so much <laughs> for agreeing to do this. We appreciate it. <laughs> Um, consider resolution uh, number 2020-14, a resolution establishing a revised system development charges pertaining to parks and recreation, sanitary sewer, and transportation, repealing resolution number 2019-09. Our community development director, Mike Bissett, will you please go through this information with us, please. Thank you, Council President and members of the Council. I'll refer you to the brief staff report that's in your packet regarding the adjust annual adjustment of system development charges to reflect the increase in construction costs. Uh, city ordinances uh, 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 specify that we use the Engineering News Record Construction Index for Seattle, Washington. That's the nearest index uh, for construction costs. Um, that index grew by 0.9% for calendar year 2019. And the ordinance before, or resolution before you this evening therefore includes a 0.9% increase in the transportation, parks and recreation, and sanitary sewer system development charges. So unless there are any questions, I'd recommend the council adopt the resolution as presented. Keeping in mind that this is a significantly lesser increase than the prior year, correct? Let me look at the prior year. I think it was four, four point something. Or <laughs> I remember it being 2.4 or 4.2. <laughs> yeah, it's not listed here. Well, it was in your write-up. <laughs> 4.9, that's correct. Yeah, 4 point. Okay, thank you. This will apply to building permits that are applied for after July 1st. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Zach. Um, so we, we use the Seattle index of index. Did we just take that as a whole or did we make any edits to it? The ordinance uh, municipal code specifies we use that index. Uh, there aren't any adjustments to it. It does have several components to it, labor, uh, goods, uh, uh, specific uh, categories of goods. Uh, uh, certainly could provide more information to the council regarding that index if it was uh, helpful. Uh, we elect to adopt that whole in whole if in future eventually or it's a it's an option to look at, at individually and use it as a basis to start assumptions and change pieces of it or is it and we adopt it all or we don't adopt any of it does that question make sense well certainly as part of a review of the municipal code related to system development charges the council could choose to use a different annual adjustment index as long as that uh, index uh, was defensible and so if there were very specific uh, interest in evaluating what indexes are used to adjust system of and charges in Oregon we certainly could look at that in the future um, I think Jennifer mentioned to me that they use the same uh, construction in index that we're using <coughs> at her prior place of employment so it's a common commonly used index uh, thank you Wendy, um, thank you for putting this together. Um, I just had a couple of questions about how is this, I know that we chose a way to determine what the system development charges have been. Um, how is it keeping up with our costs and things like that, like in, with regards to, you know, right sizing services and things like that? Do we feel like it is an accurate, keeping us in an accurate range of covering costs for the actual cost of providing services or do we know that information so that's a much bigger question that i think uh, <laughs> is uh you'll get a different answer for each of those system development charges so the parks and recreation develop system development charge is based on a um, current master plan from 2001 1999 1999 and so um the costs that were identified in that 1999 plan, I don't know that you could legitimately say are accurate at this point. Um, she is working on a plan to uh, uh, update the master plan. Um, and at that point, we'd look at a list of capital projects that would be included in a system development charge. The other consideration is that we as a community and council have decided not to cover recover full cost of uh, development through the system development charge so we've already discounted these fees um, and uh, decided as a community that the community at a whole will bear a portion of the cost of growth in the community and so it, it gets to be a much bigger question um, and it, part of it's based on the age of some of the plans do we have a part of the process that's a regular evaluation touch point that will, you know what I mean, versus just continuing with it? Wendy, could you talk into your mic a little better? Sure. Do we have a part of our process then that we're evaluating where we are on that and at some point we might check to make sure it's still, like those assumptions that we've made are still reasonable or is that initiated by us when we have a question? Historically, that's occurred as part of master plan updates, and okay. so... Uh, so we'll look at it then. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you, Wendy. Sal, do you have any question? Um, no question. Just a comment that, you know, I'm on the, the Council of Governments board, and I think almost every jurisdiction, if not everyone, uses that Seattle uh, CPI to do their rate of inflation adjustments. Okay. Thank you for that input, Sal. Adam. I'm, I'm all right with moving forward with what we got. I mean, that's been the index, and it's widely accepted throughout. So I don't, I don't see the the need to change it. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Remy. No comment. 
<laughs> okay. I'm, I've thought of another question. All right, sir. Um, so, the, so uh, sorry. The um, the transportation system development charge, that's one you run through this crazy matrix where it has all these sp specific uses, right? Like glass blowing building, um, restaurant, you know, and it spits out a then it has a metric in which you use to size it up per bed, per square foot or whatever, and then it shoots out a price, right? Did you, did I ask that correctly? I, I, that's a fairly accurate description. The um, <laughs> transportation system development charge is based on the net new vehicle trips that a land use generates during the PM peak on our system. And so right. each, each use, each business uh, has a different uh, trip generation rate. And so that you've got this list that has all these possible potential things that they've thought of, sandwich place, 7-Eleven, whatever, right? Do you guys, every time you go through that, do you keep track of every time you check a box for this and what it was? And so like, you could look back at the end of the year and say, oh, we, we had seven of these, four of these, two of these, one of these. Do, do you keep track of that? I know you. I know, uh, on whole, we get the permit issue reports, and there's that sort of general. Here's the state of building. But if you wanted to go look at it at a little bit more of a granular level to say how many B and Bs went in or whatever, that's a that's a just a general example. But using your matrix of at this point, you've you've specified to a, on a list of all these different possibilities. This one fit this specific use. Do you have? Do you keep track of that? No, um, and I'd have to look work a little more with Heather's team on what we could pull out of the building permit system that would categorize those for me. Since we're we're only entering the trips that are generated into the building permit system, and then it calculates the fee. So. We don't have necessarily a po point in the system where it's entering. This was a blacksmith shop, or yeah. this was a restaurant. Blacksmith shop. That's right. That's not. So, and then um, since we're on the topic, is that you designating blacksmith shop, or it comes to your desk and it's already designated blacksmith shop, and then you assign it the 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 cost value? It depends on the specific building permit. Um, sometimes we're getting a shell permit and we assign it a retail use. And then when an actual tenant improvement comes in with a specific use, right. we'll compare it to the shell permit. Um, rectify the delta between the assumed and the actual, okay. And some of them are very specific. This is gonna be a single family house on lot 93 in Brookshire Estates. And so that's pretty easy to identify. Okay. Thank okay. You. Let me scratch that itch. All right. Uh, I, if I don't have any other questions or concerns, uh, could I have a motion? So moved. All right, Zach. Second. And Remy. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Uh, the ayes have it. Six to zero. All right, consideration of resolution 2020-15, resolution appointing members to the urban or the McMinnville Urban Area Management Commission. Heather, would you like to talk to us about this, please? Yes, so the McMinnville Urban Area Management Commission is the um, hearings body that's been uh, assigned by both Yamhill County and the City Council to consider urban growth boundary amendments. Since we've been having some discussion about that recently, I reached out to the county to see if we could get that um, up and rolling in terms of being populated. It is assigned based on roles within Yamhill County and the City Council, and it's part of our urban growth boundary management agreement that was put in place in 1981. So the, the population for the committee is a Yamhill County Commissioner, uh, two Yamhill County Planning Commissioners, um, a City Councilor from the City of McMinnville, a Planning Commissioner from the City of McMinnville, and a Citizen Advisory Committee member from the City of McMinnville. But we recently, a couple of years ago, changed the Planning Commission to the Citizens Advisory Committee. So it's really two Planning Commissioners from the City of McMinnville. They all, they all get appointed and they're appointed based on their terms within their respective representative um, agencies that they're representing. And then a citizen at large is appointed for a four-year term and that's based on a recommendation from that body. 
Um, so Yamhill County has every year updated their membership into this committee. We have not done that. Uh, we, it hasn't seen any um, action, so to speak, since the 2015 public hearing uh, that was conducted for the See You Later project, which was eventually withdrawn. Um, I reached out to the planning commission. There are two planning commissioners that wanted to participate on it, Robert Banagay and Gary Langenwalter. Uh, Robert Banagay just got appointed to the planning commission, but he's been participating in our uh, growth planning analysis on our project advisory committees and has been a really good participant there. Um, and Gary Langenwalter's been on the planning commission for a couple of years. And then Mayor Hill would like to represent the city council on that. So this resolution is, is you officially appointing those members to this committee. We will then uh, do an advertisement for the citizen at large. Thank you, Heather. Any questions of Heather in regard to this particular issue? No. If not, could I have a motion, please? So moved. Wendy? Second. And Remy. All in favor, favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Did I get everybody? Uh, any opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Uh, so six in favor, zero opposed. <clears throat> um, okay, resolution number 2020-16, a resolution adopting corrective plan of action for fiscal year in 2018 through 2019 audit findings. Uh, our finance director, Jennifer Quellar, to present, please. Okay, um, thanks, counselors. So um, the on January 31st, 2020, the city's financial statements for the prior fiscal year 2018-19 um, were filed with the Secretary of State. And we also submitted um, the city's CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, to the Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA, in the expectation of maintaining the 30 plus year streak um, for the Excellence in Financial Reporting Award. Um, I'm also pleased to report that Marina and Company will issue an unmodified opinion, um, in other words, a, a clean opinion on our audit. But unfortunately, there is bad news, um, a material weakness what comment was received this audit cycle. Um, I am personally beyond disappointed about this finding and so sorry to have to share this news with you so early in my tenure. Um, so. When a municipality receives a material weakness finding, it's required under statute to file a plan of action with the Secretary of State within 30 days. So that means during the month of February since we issued end of, end of January. So this resolution and the plan of action, which is based on a template that the Secretary of State provides, um, is before you um, for your approval and um, in this way, we'll be able to meet the, their deadline for addressing um, the concerns raised. So um, from a timing perspective, your next meeting, March 10th, the, um, the lead auditor will be here giving her report on the audit. And it's just unfortunate the way the timing worked out that she wasn't able to join us today. Um, so if you have questions, I'm able to I'll do my best to answer them, but um, you may want to jot them down or I'll record them for when she's here if there's anything that's not addressed. So the um, staff recommendation is that you adopt this resolution um, <coughs> adopting the corrective action plan. So um, you received in your packets a copy of the action plan. Um, I'm happy to read some of the elements. Um, there's a description of the specific deficiency, um, just exactly as the auditor presented it to us um, in the um, action plan, as well as details of the, um, the four specific ways we plan to address this issue going forward. So. Um, in the interest of time, I'm happy to. I think you've been very thorough in your presentation, but if there are any questions, would you like to ask them now? Council. Uh, yeah, so. So um, just reading, this is the first we've been presented with this, so I just wanna follow up. Um, 
So essentially, the audit found that um, that due to a turnover in management at the end of the year, that the work wasn't being re the worksheets weren't being reviewed. Is that the gist of it? Yeah, there's um, the systems are set up where the um, there's there's a lot of handwork and reconciliation that goes into producing the financial statements from the data that um, comes out of the financial system. So the strong part is there was nothing wrong with the meat and potatoes accounting work that was going on throughout the year. It was taking that data and organizing it and presenting it in a way that's required in um, by the um, the standards body of GASB. Um, and so those systems are, um, well, it's handwork. So we're looking at, one of the things we're looking at doing is closing, um, closing the differences between what's produced in the financial statements and what's in the system itself, making some um, improvements there. Um, and also looking at a different way of actually going through the production process of the CAFR each year. I think you're going to be doing it in a more computerized fashion too, correct? Yeah, the, um, the, the financial software system that we own has a, um, has a module that produces a CAFR. There, it's a fairly heavy lift, and to achieve doing that between now and, I mean, the fiscal year is ending four months from now, I think is um, it would be hard for us to be able to pull that off. So my hope is, and I'm um, talking with the, the auditors, that we may be able to come up with an interim solution for the fiscal 20 cycle and look at the fiscal 21 cycle to be more automated within the financial system itself. Is, th is this a, um, a staffing issue? Do we have adequate staff to meet these requirements? Like staffing level? Um, I, as a newcomer, I, I am somewhat concerned about how, um, uh, how thin we are on the ground. But there, um, this particular issue, I don't think that was um, a primary issue. It, it really was, there was, um, I guess it even stretches back to a few years ago. The primary person who before did utilize the financial system more heavily to produce the CAFR moved on. And so no one within the finance department really understood how that worked. So they moved to a manual system, which they've been using for two or three years, I think, to produce the financial statements. And so just no one was this cycle trained in the manual system to be able to make all of the adjustments required. So going forward, do you have a plan to, number one, train up a primary staff person, but is there also a redundancy within the, do you have enough capacity to have a second person in case the first person gets hit by a bus or? Um, well, I, I prefer the lottery. Um, Scenario, but um, <laughs> I, I, I grew up with the bus theory. I prefer the lottery. I appreciate that. I'll use that going forward. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it's, it would be a challenge. I mean, there are, there are five people in the department. Um, there is one, um, one accountant who is working with me, and I will be working with him to get him more on board. It's. Just um, Gasby, Gasby accounting is very particular and um, challenging to understand in and of itself. So it's not a skill set that's widely um, out there in um, in accounting land. People are focused on FASB. I myself came out of the nonprofit arena and we were FASB. So moving to GASB over the last decade or more of my career, it's it's been challenging. I learned something new every cycle. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or concerns? 
If not, may I have a motion, please? So moved. Wendy? Second. Second from Remy. Wrong way. Uh, okay, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 And all opposed, uh, please indicate by saying nay. Uh, six in favor, zero. Opposed. Next is consideration 20 of uh, resolution number 2020-17, a resolution approving the acquisition of property and or temporary construction easements from Jackson Miller and Kathleen Spring, Gary and Paula McK McKee, and Brandy Pointer for the old Sheridan Road Improvement Transportation Bond. And Mike, would you please present for us? Thank you, Council President, members of the Council. I'll refer you to your staff report that's in the packet from Engineering Services Manager Larry Sherwood, uh, as well as the attachments, um, which provide a great deal of information of the, the areas that we're uh, proposing to purchase, two parcels of right-of-way and three temporary construction easements to facilitate the construction of the Old Sheridan Road uh, corridor project, which is <coughs> scheduled to bid this spring and be under construction this calendar year. So uh, the total purchase price for these parcels is 18,900 plus escrow and closing fees. And we note that we have one more uh, file uh, that we're still working on that will be before you at a future council date. So unless there are any questions, I'd recommend that the council adopt the resolution as presented. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any questions or concerns, councilors? Looks good. Okay. Uh, and may I have a motion, please? So moved. Remy? Second. Zach. <clears throat> All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Hearing none. Uh, six in favor. Zero. Opposed. And I believe that we are at the point of adjournment. So. We are going to have an executive session after the meeting. That executive session pursu is pursuant to 192.662F uh, and 192.355.